Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, bodhisattvas, and Buddhas to be. Um, it's a wonderful feeling to be back home in Australia. Uh, as introduced by Venerable Jue Shen, I was born in Taiwan, and, but I was raised in Australia. And after graduating from UNSW, I became renounced and have since spent most of my time in Taiwan and abroad. And, but coming home is always a very, very different feeling. For one thing, as soon as I landed in Australia, I realized I can understand people's English. <laughs> yeah. It's not the American accent, it's not the British accent, it's my home accent. Yeah, much clearer, much more friendly, and so that was the immediate change. And secondly, I am grateful to Zhongtian Temple for giving me this opportunity to meet with our English-speaking community and to talk about my journey of self-discovery. Right? And so today I've titled my talk, We Are All Buddhas, my journey of self-discovery for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I speak of the journey, it's not just mine, it's all of yours. As practicing or learning Buddhists, I hope that what I have to share today could be something of important reference to your practice and cultivation. And so if that works, and then it will reflect quite well with the first half of my title, which is, We Are All Buddhas. Right? The amazing, amazing discovery by the prince in India to realize that all of us has that potential, that amazing potential to really, really find our true self. And so I want to begin by talking about this journey that was embarked on by a human being who also shared his personal experiences with us. And I'm not sure how many have since then attained Buddhahood, but the only thing I'm sure of is that at least we are on that similar path. Okay. But as we talk about that path, many of us come across the idea of the Buddha or Buddhism um, through various different ways. Okay. For myself, uh, when I was born in Taiwan, I pretty much encountered Buddhism as a heavily religious idea where you, did, you paid a lot of homage, you did a lot of praying, all for the hope that the Buddha will bless you. So I was told by my, by my mom to always pay respect to the Buddha so I could become a smarter student. Yeah. <laughs> I could marry into a good life and that I will die a good death. Okay. That was a lot of fun, especially when I was being told of that truth at eight, when my grandmother says, keep chanting Buddha's name so you will be reborn in pure land when you die. Right. I had this whole question. I turned to my grandmother and I asked her, Grandma, I'm only eight. Right? <laughs> Why are you teaching me how to die now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure, teach me how to die well. I will appreciate that. But can you please first teach me how to live? Right? And then my grandmother looked at me and then turned away and continued to chant, Omitofo, Omitofo, Omitofo. <laughs> yeah. I could understand it because she was 75. Yeah, but for me, I wanted to really find out more about what this whole idea of Buddhism has to offer. Yeah, so really, there's that question, you know, where did the whole idea of Buddhism come about in the beginning? Okay. It wasn't the Buddha who, upon attaining enlightenment, turned to the heavenly beings or the five bhikkhus and said, hey, I have awakened to this whole idea of Buddhism, so I'm here to teach you Buddhism. Right. He never said that. Instead, when he was asked, you claim to become awakened and enlightened. So what exactly are you? Are you a god? He said, no. Right. Are you a creator? He said, no. Right. Are you a ruler of the world now that you claim to be the Buddha? Right. All along, the Buddha said, no. And so they asked him, you keep saying no to our queries about who you are as a Buddha. So who exactly are you? What exactly are you? The Buddha quietly turned to these heavenly beings and said, I am simply awake. Right. Awaken to the, real, to, to, to the reality that we are living. A reality sometimes we don't really see face to face, eye to eye. A reality that sometimes is not as real as we want it to be. But nevertheless, that's what I have become awakened to. And so to be, tr to be honest, the whole idea of Buddhism did not arise until the 19th century when this Portuguese expedition 
went to the Dunhuang Caves in China and discovered this whole lot of Buddhist images and scrolls and said, wow, they must be of extreme value as oriental objects. So this person by the name of Oro Stein paid a Taoist monk a very low amount of money and brought home all the treasures back to the UK. Right? So up to date, the Chinese regard him as the stealer of the treasures. But today, when we look at what he has managed to preserve, we would say he, he was the one who preserved the amazing teachings that were found in the Dunhuang Caves. But most importantly, as he read through these scripts, he said, this is an amazing discovery by a man, right? What this man had discovered was the theory or this whole idea of awakening, right? So since he claims to be Buddha, right? He who has awakened, right? The whole root word of Buddha means to awake. So if it represents an amazing teaching, why don't we just refer to this doctrine and teaching as Buddhism, right? The concept of awakening, right? The concept of awakening as a term for Buddhism or a religion of Eastern and Central Asia based on the teachings of Gautama Siddhartha. Okay. But as it passed into China, we begin to refer to it as Fo Jiao, right? a type of religion, a religion of the Buddha, right? a practice of the Buddha's teachings. And so this poses two very different kinds of, awake, uh, of understanding in myself, having been raised in Australia, but based on a very Chinese Buddhist background. We are constantly being asked to weigh out the religious side and the everyday life side of Buddhism or Fo Jiao that we are facing. Okay. And all along, it's been a fun journey because being in Australia, it gave me much more chances to really rediscover my own definition instead of simply inheriting the tradition that has been given to us by our predecessors. And so I appreciate this teaching by George Bernard Shaw. When he says, life isn't about finding yourself, he first denies the conventional opening statement about why you would be a Buddhist. Right? People will ask, why did you become a Buddhist? To find myself. George Bernard Shaw would have said, eh, no. Right? You have always been there. You never lost yourself, so you, don't need, to you need, don't need to find yourself. But he says, no, it's not about finding yourself. Lies about creating yourself. Right? What kind of value do you give to yourself? What kind of face do you give to that self? And so that too reflected quite well with Siddhartha's comment. Do not take other words for granted. Do not take for granted what others tell you about what I teach. Take it into your own hands, put it into test, trial it, doubt it, prove it before you claim it to be yours. I believe that would be our process of self-reinvention and creation. Okay. And so having said that, as, we come, as I come along a uh, basic upbringing in Taiwan and then my having received my education in Australia and then in the previous 20 years really having had that opportunity to see what Buddhism has become across the world. These are the types of Buddhism that I see. Okay. First of all, in the East, just as my grandmother had told me, right, learning is about how to transcend life and death. Right? I appreciate that. But it's just that it turned from this type of religion, right? Transcending life is about offering as much incenses as possible. The bigger, the better, right? right? So you have to make sure your incense is in the center so the Buddha will reply and respond to your prayer. Yeah. But as Buddhism continues to reinvent itself in uh, an Australian setting, we discover that it's taken in something a little, a little bit more different now. What we see is Buddhism in the West gives us a challenge on how we understand reality based on the teachings. Right? I'm not sure if you chanted the Heart Sutra today. The Heart Sutra is really about a journey of understanding reality. Okay, so how do we understand reality? When Buddhism passed to the West, it was the uh, religious teachers, the scientists and the philosophers who began thinking about this mystical oriental 
faith. And so when Bishop George Berkeley came across this very interesting Eastern teaching on psychology, right, he started to explore the concepts of Buddhism by asking this question. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? So I would like to ask you that question. Does it? Yes. Okay. So what about those who think no? Okay, we have one, two. Yeah. Okay, for many reasons, right? And so this is how George Berkeley explained his answer. His answer was no. Why? Because sound is the vibration of air that is caught by the organisms in your ears. If your ears are not there to catch the vibration of the air, then there is no sound. Right? This is the Western exploration of reality from a Buddhist perspective. If you think it's there, it's really not there. Because when I ask that question, you probably imagine the sound of a tree falling in a forest. But even if you imagine that bang, right, it doesn't make a sound. So that's how the exploration began in the West. But now as we come into what we call a modern day world where we live as global citizens, right? many of us have been raised as polyglots who grow up in at least four countries. We discover that Buddhism has gone from the transcendence of life and death to the understanding of reality, now into a way of life. Okay. We are hoping that the Dharma could offer a guidance as to how we live better before we die better. Right? Both are important, I would have to say. Okay. And therefore, now we look at Buddhism in its face. Right? We share it among our families. Right? We pass on our values. But most importantly, we leave an open path for our future generation to explore. So they are the ones to, to decide if you should choose the path which Siddhartha did, how would you travel it? And I hope you travel it well. Right? That is the modern day. So as I think about the involvement of Buddhism under my own personal experiences, right, I can't help but wonder, so in this way, what kind of Buddhist teachings offers us a guidance or a path to really finding that betterment of life and death? Okay. And then I was handed a very, very simple scroll of sutra, something which probably has been your first encounter at Zhongtian. Right. When you come and join the chanting, they will say, hey, take this one. This is the easy one. It's nice and short, right? It's the core of the Dharma chanted, right? And then you could be closer to that path. Okay. Which is that sutra? Yes, the Heart Sutra. Right. As we talk about the Pranya Paramita Hridaya Sutra, right, it really talks about the heart of Buddha's teachings. Right, thousands and thousands of scrolls condensed into 260 characters. Okay. But what it is about? Is it about your heart? No, right? The heart is the descriptive word for the core of the Buddha's teachings. And therefore, if it's not about the heart, what you need to understand is at the same time, when you chant this, what you understand hopefully would be an understanding or a perception that is derived from your heart that also continues to evolve. Because you are a different person every day. Right? If today you gaze upon the Buddha or the Bodhisattva and feel a moment of compassion, you share that kindness with the people around you, your heart becomes that of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva. But if today you turn around and scream at somebody out of anger, Right? You're no longer with the heart of the Buddha. What kind of heart do you have? Still your heart. Right? You just allowed it to change. So how are you able to go from a heavenly state to a, what we call a really terrible state just in a moment? But it all comes from the heart. The answers could be found from the Heart Sutra. Okay, so what I would like to do is maybe in the next hour or two, talk a little bit about how I have come to understand the Heart Sutra. Okay. So as you continue to chant all of this, have you ever wondered what exactly is it talking about? Can anybody in one short sentence tell me your understanding of the Heart Sutra? Right. I look at you, you try to turn away, right? <laughs> and I look at many of you who have really repeated these, you know, 
concise ancient Buddhist sutra maybe for thousands of times. Yeah, but what is the reason why to why we never actually sought to understand what it is telling us? If that's the truth, then the next hour hopefully should be something of reference to you. Okay. So this is how I understand it. Okay. Although it begins with Avalokiteshvara. Right? There's a, actually a longer version of the Heart Sutra. It begins with the Buddha meditating. He was entering deep, deep meditative samadhi. And then suddenly, two of his disciples who were also practicing are inspired to speak up. So this is a pretty common setting of an opening in a dialogue between the Buddha and his disciples, except this time the Buddha chose not to talk through his own voice. He chose to talk through two of his best teachers, best students. So suddenly in that deep medita meditative concentration, his most wise student named Sariputra, the foremost in wisdom, suddenly spoke up. Because somebody has to open up a question if for a discussion in, on the Dharma to happen. So suddenly Sariputra turns to Bod uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara and asks, Oh, great one, I heard that you are so well practiced in your perfection of wisdom, right? the Pranyaparamita. Can you tell me how a good man and a good woman should practice accordingly in order to attain that perfection of wisdom? Right. Imagine when you receive that question. And so the Bodhisattva goes into that very elegant recline, right? the wonderful Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, and begins to answer that question. Okay. So what we see in this case is the fact that the Heart Sutra is really about a sharing by Avalokiteshvara on how he had attained the perfection of wisdom. Right? And he does it in such an elegant way. Okay. And we would say it's a recall or a, re, a backflash of an enlightened one on his journey to enlightenment, on his journey to self-discovery. Okay. So the Heart Sutra opens by saying, when Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva was causing in a deep pranyaparamita, he realized, first of all, that the five skandhas are empty in nature, and thus he overcame all ills and suffering. Right. So it's a very familiar opening to all of us, correct? We hear, read, and see this all the time. Okay. But what does this line mean? Okay. And we would say, as Avalokiteshvara sits in that very elegant recline, he decides to give us a recap on his journey to self-discovery on three levels. And when he says the five skandhas are empty in nature, he's presenting to us the first level of self-discovery. That is, emptiness on its most simple level. So if you have attended the classes on Buddhism, you might re understand that the five skandhas are what? Form, perception, volition, mental formation, and consciousness. Okay. So we pretty much kind of just skip by that and move on to the next line. Okay. So what exactly does it mean? And so the Bodhisattva tells us, okay, in order to understand the perfection of wisdom, you first have to come to reality with yourself. What is that true self? And is this the you sitting here, that your, your true self? Yes or no? Okay, if you said no, then who is sitting here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it your body? Right. What is it? So actually, and the answer is yes. The you sitting here are as real as you can be. Right? To be real is your first step to understanding reality. Okay. But he goes on to say that the first thing you recognize is how real you are, but at the same time, how much, how fast that real you actually change. Okay. So there are a lot of misconceptions about emptiness which tells us that you are not here. Right? I once hopped on a taxi in Taipei, and on the way, this taxi driver just kept turning over to look at me, fidgeting, right, trying to hold back his question. So finally I asked him, you have a question for me, right? <laughs> and so he was very surprised. He was like, oh, how do you know? Uh, yeah, Because I can see you turning around looking at me very, you know, out of curiosity. Right? It's as simple as that. Yeah. And so I said, okay, if you have any questions, just ask. That's fine. 
And so he asked me, Venerable, right? you Buddhists always talk about emptiness, right? that this real you is not here. Right? So if you don't exist, right, can I treat you as empty? Okay. Right. He's right, right? That's how we explain emptiness. So in reply, I asked him, you know, Sir, as we arrive at the destination, right, if you treat me as emptiness, as someone who doesn't exist, I'm going to walk away without paying you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then he goes, no, 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 you have to pay. That doesn't work, right? <laughs> yeah. There you go. I told him, right, if you treat me as real as a human being, then I will pay you. Because that's the way natural um, reality actually works, right? Because I'm as real as I can be. But the only thing that is empty is of a constant, never-changing nature. So when, by saying that empty, right, it means that it's a characteristic that we have, right? It's not a set nature. We are actually empty in our ability to never change. Would you agree? Yeah. So a few moments ago, Venerable Jue Sang was in a meeting, right? So at that per at that moment, she was a construction director, yeah. And then, 10 minutes ago, she was on stage introducing me. She was the coordinator. Right? And now, she has very kindly and compassionately joined you in the audience as a listener. So which one is the real Venerable Jue Sen? Right. All of them. Yeah. So that emptiness of the self can be thus concluded as a self that has enough flexibility to be anything and nothing. Playing the right role at the same time, at the right time in the right place, gives your, you the ability to remain empty in a self. So you don't insist. Because Venerable Josan would have never told me, hey, I'm the abbess, I should sit in the middle. Right? She, does, she knows that does not work. So it's an awareness of reality of when to be what at the right time. Okay, so as we talk about the five skandhas, you look at it this way. Right? We begin with form. Right? And so by an existence of the self, we would say, yes, first of all, through your eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. We see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Right? So at this moment, if the eyes sees something, right? a conglomeration of flowers, reflection of light, reflection of air, right? what happens is after form or object, what we sense is we perceive something. For example, when you perceive this, right, you will think of this as a cup, right? But I haven't done anything to it. Why would you know that it's a cup? Because you have used it before. You have realized that usually people hold things in a cup. You drink out of it, right? But the funny thing is your eyes just make contact with it. Why would you tell yourself that it's a cup, right? Because what happens is as you look at the form, right, you remember at the level of the formation of mental image from the previous time that you have used this thing. So what you are doing is not a simple interaction with this cup, but a mere retraction of the memory of your previous interaction with this. So you tell yourself, this is a cup. Right? You go out into the garden, you see this is a flower. Okay. But now we have virtual reality that could just pop up a 3D flower in front of you and then you will still tell yourself that this is a flower. Right? So at that moment, what happened to yourself is that you allowed your vision, your hearing, your senses to decide what you're feeling. Okay? And so by saying that the five scanners are empty, it's merely telling you that don't trust what you see. What you see is not what you see. Okay? You need a bit more time to interact with it and to make sure that every time you experience it, it's going to be something different. So allow yourself to have each unique experiences before you decide on what your reality is. Okay, say for example, what do you see here? Ice cream, right? It's a smooth, yellow, glittering, sweetening scoop in front of you. Okay? So that's exactly what my friend did when she went to a five-star hotel restaurant saw that round scoop sitting on the table in the restaurant. She immediately picked it up, put it into her mouth by thinking, ice cream! And then what happened was, ew, it's actually margarine. 
So I want to recap. What happened here? That self thinking that what you're seeing is really ice cream has deceived yourself by telling your mind that based on my previous experience of ice cream that is round, right? It's tasty. It's heaven sent, right? Anytime in the future you see the same image again, you taste the same thing again, it's going to be ice cream. Okay? And so if we recap, what happens is at that moment, we take out from our memories our experiences of the ice cream, right? And going back to that mental formation, the concept of ice cream thereby arises. Just as I mentioned the concept of coffee right now, right? You suddenly can taste the fragrance of coffee, right? Suddenly you're awake. Yeah. Suddenly you're joyful, right? And so you talk your mind into having really receive the concept of coffee, but at the same time, you haven't really drink, drank, drunk a single drop. And so that's what I mean by mental formation. You tend to talk yourself into the reality you're seeing. And so once again, you go back to your sensations, right? Your eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body to experience the reality again before you decide. Okay, so I would ask you to please be careful when somebody hands you a cup and calls it coffee. Take a good look. <laughs> Smell it. Yeah, confirm before you do. Okay. So this is my understanding of when the Bodhisattva says he saw that the five skandhas are empty, thus he overcame all ills and suffering. Right? So by understanding that our experiences are constantly changing, we won't be fooled into our own expectations. Because most of the time when we give rise to expectations based on our experiences and perceptions, most of the time we become disappointed. And that's where the ills and suffering arise. Okay. Again, we refer to the ills and suffering as dukkha. Okay. Suffering is a state of mind or a feeling when you're mentally and physically unwell. But sometimes I have a problem with this translation. Because by dukkha, it literally means when the wheel of a cart falls out of its pivot. So you might imagine when a cart gets pulled along by an ox, but the wheel is not well fixed into its socket, right? That cart is not going to move forward smoothly. It's going to struggle, it will break down. So you might imagine the sense of dukkha when we align it to our expectations of reality, and when reality fails to be, we are going to suffer because something doesn't fit. Something doesn't seem to fit quite well. And therefore, I would like to say a quick conclusion of what the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara means by the five skandhas being empty. First of all, yes, you are you. Right? You are as real as you. And you, ex in fact, are what you see. Your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body all exist. Okay? But the most important thing is when we move on to the fact that the five skandhas are empty, it really depends on how you react to the things that are happening. Right? How do we align our thoughts to reality? And thirdly, you are you because you experience each incident differently. And that creates you. But please remember the next time it happens, it's going to be very different. And so the realization of emptiness on a self level is only an awakening for us to think about how fast the self changes. Okay. The self you think is you is always changing. So give yourself a few more moments to experience what's coming in front of you. And secondly, there are many of self, such selves that arise all the time. Because every day, every moment, you confront reality with a rather different self. A happy self, a joyful self, a doubtful self. And then the most important thing is when the Bodhisattva says, hey, this is empty, wake up to it and think about how fast that will change. And so, in conclusion, don't cling on to any of them as the real you while you make peace with each individual experience. Okay. Therefore, the five skandhas are empty. Okay. And so I want to use an example of, about myself. Right. As we talk about the five skandhas are empty, we might discover that in most cases, we tend to scare ourselves before anything happens. So a few years ago, I was in Beijing, and then our building in Beijing was a rectangular one that had a very long corridor. 
So on the morning that I arrived, they settled me into my room. So before I entered my room, I heard this little girl running around screaming, and she was wearing a skirt, and she was about one meter tall. I took a quick glance of her, and then I moved on to my class in Beijing. And so that was a long day. By the time I finished my class, it was already 11 p.m. So as I had made my way back to my room, I realized they had turned off the lights on in the corridor. So it was a long, dark corridor, except for the green egress light at the end. Right? Familiar feeling? Yeah. So I told myself not to think about anything, just walk along, you know, reach my room. But all along, I could feel something behind me standing at the edge of the corridor, right, playing around with her skirt and staring at me. Yeah. So that was 11 p.m. And then I wondered why a little girl would be away from her parents and standing at the end of a long, dark corridor, right? And that started to feel quite spooky, right? Because obviously that would not be a normal little girl, right? What kind of little girl appears at 11 p.m. in the dark? Yeah. Not ghosts, your mind, right? The girls that the kind of girl you create in your mind. And then I asked myself. Hey, as a monastic, I'm not supposed to be scared, right? So why am I all spooked now by that little girl at the end of the corridor? You know, hey, turn my turn my mind back onto the Buddha. So I kept walking back to my room. Then for the rest of that night, I couldn't stop thinking about what that little girl was doing. And then the morning came. I stepped out of my room, and sunlight actually spilled through the window. So as I looked down the end of the corridor, I burst into laughter. What I had been thinking was a little girl all along was just a huge tree plant, <laughs> placed next to the window beneath the air conditioning. So that's why it was swaying, right? <laughs> yeah. And so all along, I had been scared by my own atman, my own personal perceptions, right? Something that wasn't real but had been made very, really real. And that's where my dukkha comes from. And so we might imagine the process of meditation. If we had that chance to really think about where our emotions and perceptions comes from, we will have more time to really digest it. So I would say on that very first level, yes, you are true, you are real, but you're always changing. So embrace that ever-changing self. Okay. And by that ever-changing self, I would say we can move on to that second line. Right? Having explained that the five skandhas are empty. Avalokiteshvara then turns on to Sariputra and say, "Remember the next thing, right? Form is emptiness, and the very empty the emptiness is form, right? So now we're think, talking about emptiness as a type of nature, right? A nature in all living beings. And while when we talk about form, it's a phenomena, right? So if you're looking at ourselves as a person, how does our nature differ for different from our Form. Okay. You would say in nature I'm a compassionate person, right? But by appearance I look angry, right? Remember all back in our school days, right? Whenever we walked into the library, the grumpy-looking librarian, why、right, would be the face that greets you, that kind of scares you a little bit, yeah. But once you start to look for books, she smiles, and then she turns into heaven, right? And so we would say by this. He has a question of the difference between water, wind, and wave.、Right. So in nature, water made of H two O is just water. But added to the movement applied by gravity and wind, somehow water gets sprayed into air and becomes what we see as wave.、Right. But the moment it falls back into the water, it becomes water again. Therefore, form is emptiness. Emptiness is form.、Okay. We are simply the same in nature, but we choose to react very, very differently when different situations arise.、Okay. But whatever it is, we have to remember that it is deep within our heart that we can find our true, calm, and compassionate self.、Okay. It's not just what you think, but rather. In the end, what do you come to be? So there was a lady who was about to go on a holiday. She checked herself in at the airport, 
and she had about an hour before boarding time. But since it was traveling season, the lounge was very packed. So she had no choice but to share a table with the men. Okay. And that ruined her mood a little bit because she thought to herself, hey, I'm about to go on a holiday, right? so I want to relax. And, but now I have to share a table with the men at a very crowded lounge. What should I do? Okay. She told herself, okay, relax. Remember, I'm enjoying my holiday. Right? So what would make myself enjoy my time? She took out her book, her favorite book, and her favorite bag of chocolate chip cookie. Right? I'm going to read something I enjoy. I'm going to eat these heavenly drops of crunchy, juicy chocolate chip cookie. That's how I ask myself to enjoy myself. So she sits down, reads through a few pages in the book, right? and then she reaches out to the bag of chocolate cookies on the table. She takes one to eat it. But a funny thing happened. The man sitting across from her looked up, smiled at her, and without saying a word, also helped himself to a chocolate cookie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was strange. She started to feel extremely uncomfortable. Right? How rude of you to not even ask for permission to eat out of my bag of chocolate cookie. Right? Then she reminded herself again, I'm on holidays. Right? I have to get myself back to that good mood. It's okay. I have a big heart, enough, you know, a heart big enough to share one chocolate chip cookie. So she went back to her book. She read through a few more pages. She reached out for a second chocolate chip cookie. Funny thing happened. The man also smiled again, quietly helped himself to a second chocolate chip cookie. Okay. So this moment, she, up until now, she becomes a little bit agitated. Right? So at that moment, she could no longer focus on her book. All she could think about is, how unfortunate am I to have come across a rude man on my beautiful holiday's beginning? Right? So she forced a smile and pretended to be reading the book, right? all along trying to suppress her anger. So for the rest of the waiting time, every time she reached out for a chocolate cookie, the man across from her would also do the same. Right? Until there came the last piece of chocolate cookie sitting in the bag. Yeah, so the lady looked at the man with a smile thinking, hmm, I'm going to see if you're going to be polite enough to let my have my last piece of chocolate cookie. Okay. Then the man also smiled back, quietly reached for that chocolate chip cookie, broke it in half and shared half with her. Yeah. And so at that moment, she could no longer contain her anger. Right? She was about to scream at the man for being so rude. Right? But luckily, the call for boarding came, so she packed herself up and rushed on board right? with a very angry heart. Right? All along thinking, oh, how unlucky of, of me to come across an, a, a terrible man at the beginning of my journey. But when she finally settled herself down on the, her seat, she told myself, okay, I'm on, on, my, on my way to Bali, right, to a beautiful beach. I'm going to relax and not to be angry. Right? So she took a deep breather, reached for her bag for her book and said, okay, I'm going to keep reading my book. And then what she saw underneath her book in the bag is a totally new bag of unopened chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> yeah. So all along, she has been eating out of the man's bag. <laughs> who smiled every single time, <laughs> remained polite, didn't scream at her or frown at her, and was so generous to even share the last piece with her. Right. And so as we say, form is no different from emptiness. Right? It means that it's no different from what we look on the surface can be the same as our flexibility to choose the right role to play at the right time and to respond in the right way at the right time. Therefore, your anger, right, that your wind of anger once forced back into the water will still be that calm and peaceful water. Right? So therefore, the Heart Sutra tells us to only seek that true nature of flexibility and openness that selflessness, instead of turning, dancing, and tangoing with the wind and the wave, which mistakens us to be that true reality. Okay. And so as we think about how far we are from the attainment of the perfection of wisdom, 
right? We could meditate and meditate and meditate, feel peaceful for the five minutes. But as soon as you walk out, right, a little girl flies your way, sets her ice cream flying into your face, right? I guarantee you the, the, the calmness will go away very, very quickly. Yeah. And so therefore, our understanding of that emptiness really has to come both in both ways. First of all, how do we understand the relationship between existence and emptiness? I quite like this phrase given by the Venerable Master. He says in this verse, in our understanding of emptiness and existence, first of all, you have to understand that there is no self. There's no people and there's no world. And then he completes his couplet by saying that the next thing you need to understand that, yes, Having understood that there is no self, the next thing you need to realize that is that, yes, everything in this world, all the matters are there. When people try to reason with you, their reasons are there, right? And there are exact sentient beings. Okay. And so how he understands emptiness is through a sense of reality by how we make peace with ourselves. And so by saying that there is no self, no people, no world, it applies to our moments of cultivation. But any moment you step off from your meditation cushion and into the reality of the world, you face real human beings with real human emotions. Okay. So how are we able to really use our skillful means, our skillful application of the Dharma to the people who cross paths with us will determine how well we have understood the Dharma. I see how Venerable Master understands a harmony of both emptiness and existence in very interesting ways. Because by saying there is no certain things, we set up a principle of our expectations of reality. And so after I became renounced, um, I had the opportunity to start serving as his personal interpreter. And that's when the journey of my life began. It began in such an unimaginable way that my first journey was when the September 11th attack happened. Okay. I was so excited about my traveling around the world that I would meet peaceful and wise people. Right. But that was the day when we actually booked our tickets to New York in October of 2001. Right. A month prior to that, the two planes that were hijacked flew into the WTC. Right? and took away thousands of lives. So I could still remember that morning when it happened. Phone calls came from all around the world trying to talk Venerable Master out of going to New York. They were telling him it's simply too dangerous. Right? Don't go. The terrorists are st were still at loose. Right? And they were sending anthrax around in envelopes. We could get hurt easily. So Master, please don't go. And I could remember for 30 minutes, even after the phone calls, all the venerables around the master would do the same thing by trying to talk him out of it. So he listened to all this reasoning quietly for half an hour. And finally, at the end of the half hour, he turned to us and said, okay, can I talk now? <laughs> right. He gave us our chance to list our reasoning. And then he says, I understand that you're trying to tell me not to go, but this is exactly the moment when we as Buddhists need to go and offer peace and compassion. Right? Think about the people who are still very scared. That's why we should go. Okay. And so everybody stopped trying to convince him. And then a month later, we managed to arrive in New York. And we were actually very fortunate to be given the chance to really reach into ground zero and to conduct a prayer service because what the government had received was that among many of the victims, they were Buddhists. So they were happy for a Buddhist organization to conduct a service to comfort the lives that were lost. So on that morning, we flew in and before we landed, the pilot made sure that we had a chance to circle above ground zero. And this is what I saw. One month after the crash, the steel was still burning. I could still hear the screeching, and they were burning at 1,000 degrees Celsius. Right. So 
I felt like the plane was about to plunge into ground zero. Yeah. And as we got closer and closer to ground zero, our heart just continued to sink. It was just a, a whole atmosphere of despair and sadness. People were quiet, right? The security guards stood on their posts without emotions. And you will see the workers continue to clear up this ground with long faces. And so just the 200 meters of distance between entrance to ground zero took us two hours because almost after every post, we were being asked to stop for a security check. Right? And so as we arrived at the spot, when we set up to do our usual chanting, right, the three recitations of Av Avalokiteshvara, the recitation of the great compassion Dharani, the prayers, and the offering of flowers. Venerable Master told us the procedure. He says, we're going to do this and that and that and that. Make sure you follow the procedure. Then he turned to me, right, the new beginner interpreter. He said one thing to me. He said, remember, you shall translate as I speak. Yeah. That was a pretty interesting instruction, right? Usually an interpreter would just translate whatever the speaker says. So I found it quite interesting, you know, with wonders. But then, as the ceremony began, you would see that as we did the three recitations of Avalokiteshvara and the Great Compassion Dharani, there were about 100 workers around us, Latinos, African Americans, National Americans, and Asians. They all stood there with their arms crossed, wondering what this group of weirdly dressed Buddhists were doing. Right? We were uttering a series of words that didn't un they didn't understand. And so they were quite curious, but taken aback by our strange actions. And then came the Buddha's light prayer. Okay, so for those who have heard the Buddha's light prayer, you will know that Venerable Master usually begins by saying, O oh, great compassionate Buddha, right? please accept our sincerest prayers. So that's what I was expecting. But instead, he opened up his prayer by saying the following. He says, O oh, great compassionate God, Allah, Muhammad, Jesus, and Buddha. Then I just froze. I turned around with my mouth open. I looked at my teacher and thinking, aren't you here to say a Buddhist prayer? Right? And then, so he quickly just tapped me and says, didn't I tell you to just translate as I say? <laughs> yeah. He already knew how I would react to his prayer. So I gathered myself together and I repeated his word, right? Dear God, Allah, Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha. But as, a, as soon as I said that, I realized all the security guards around us then unfolded their arms and had their mouth open. They were as surprised as me. Why would Buddhists come and conduct a prayer that begins with God and Jesus and Allah? And then his second line was, Please bless your people so that they can rest in peace in your heaven, in your garden, in your pure land. Right? So that they may be free from fear, free from worry. Let the disease rest in peace and let the survivors be free from their fears and sadness. Then as soon as I translated that, some of the security guards just started crying. I realized it was, the exactly, it, was, it was exactly what they needed. They needed a moment of comfort. But had we just gone in to conduct our usual Buddhist practices based on, on our own perceptions and principles, nothing would have happened. So by the end of the prayer, after making offerings of flowers, these gods, Caucasians, Latinos, African Americans, all reached Venerable Master. They approached him and asked the question, Thank you for the prayer. I am not a Buddhist, but I'm very scared now. Can you please bless me? Right. And immediately, without a word, Venerable Master sprinkled the great Dharani water on them and added one line in English. He said, God bless you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You might imagine being that, that being my first trip, I was extremely surprised with what my teacher was doing. 
right? When we were so happy and joyful in having the opportunity to represent the Buddhist organizations in conducting a service, this is what he had been doing all along. Yeah, so I was confused as ever, wondering, you know, is this the way we are ever going to promote Buddhism in the future? Do we always have to include God or Allah or Jesus? Right. Then on our way back to the hotel, my teacher turned around to me and said the following thing to me. He says, do not ever think that just because you're a Buddhist, everything you do will have to be about Buddhism. Right? Everywhere you go, if you, your words and your actions never offered any moment of peace and comfort, then you're as good as having never came. Okay. So that was my first lesson as an interpreter to a teacher of the so-called humanistic Buddhism. I actually came to realize that Buddhism can take so many forms. And now as we give it the prefix humanism, right? As teachers or practitioners, if whatever it is that we learn or practice do not offer help, a peace, to the betterment of other human lives, then we are not practicing Buddhism. And so that's why he says, on a personal level, there's no self, right? There's no world, there's no reality. But on an interpersonal level, on a worldly level, there is always human beings. There's always the need of other people that could go beyond your own personalities and expectations. So remember what remains empty is not the world, but your own preconceptions. And so we go on to that first level of understanding the self in that way. So we say again, in plain words, emptiness does not mean that things don't exist. Instead, it refers to the characteristic of everything that have no substantial self. We can never remain unchanging or the same. And because of this empty nature, we have that endless potential to become nothing and everything. That's why the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara begins his journey of enlightenment by first talking to us about human experiences. Right? The five skandhas are empty. Okay, and so as he goes on to that next level, right, we go from the emptiness of the self to that second level of emptiness, which tells us that not even just the self is empty that way. Everything you experience is the same. So he says, O Sariputra, all dharmas are marked with emptiness. They are not produced nor or stopped, not defiled or immaculate, not deficient or complete. Right? And so by this, the marks of all existences really tells you that even though they may look, appear as they are, but the most important thing is for you to really reflect within, just like that bag of chocolate cookies, right? Or the dukkha we inflict onto ourselves. Right? This lady looking for her lost puppy, right? Poor thing, I hope the puppy's alive. Uh, yeah. But you might imagine when Venerable Huike walks up to Bodhidharma and says, please help me find my heart. I can't find my heart. Right? I don't know how to settle my heart. Then Bodhidharma turned to his most intelligent student and says, you can't settle your heart? Fine, give me your heart. Bring your heart to me, I can settle it for you. But he goes, but I can't, my I, I can't find my heart. And then, in conclusion, Bodhidharma says, there, your heart has been settled. Right. The preconceptions created by the heart is not there. The moment you realize that nothing is really there until you seek within, what you come to decide is you really decide what you see, but don't trust them. So as Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara says that all Phenomena are marked with the characteristics of emptiness, right? That's what, how we mean by that there is no eye, no ears, no tongue, no body, or no mind. Right? That is not to say that you have no eyes, no ear, no tongue, no body. Right? That would be pretty scary. It's simply telling you that don't rely solely on your eye, your nose, your ears, and your body. Allow that deeper level of wisdom to tell you what you see. Okay. 
So what you, look, what you see in front of you could be two things right now. You would either see the side of a man's face or the half front of the man's face. Okay. And then when we ask you the question, which one is the real, the, the real face, right, the answer we'll get by saying that by no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind, neither of them are real. It's our eyes that deceive us. But what we see and sense can really help us determine what the world looks like. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Which direction is the car moving? Is it to the left or to the right? Can I see a show of hand? If the car to you is moving to the right of the screen, please raise your hand. Okay, what about those moving to the left? Okay, and someone says both, right? Yeah. So who is right, who is wrong? Okay. But this again proves that how much we're deceived by our, our sensual roots. Because this is what we know as the wagon wheel effect. Right? Your eyes can really decide which direction the car is moving. So what you do is, if you put your focus on the spot of the man over here, close your eyes and open your eyes again, then the train will move in that direction. Right? But if you put your eyes on this side of the window, close your eyes and open your eyes again, then the car will be moving to the right of the screen. Right? Give it a try. Now decide which direction you like and then close your eyes. Okay. Okay, close your eyes and open. Right, one direction. Does it really follow the focus you have set on? Yes? Okay, now tell yourself that I want the train to move in the, in the other direction. Okay, close your eyes. Okay, open your eyes and set your eyes on the other side of the screen. Yeah, right. And therefore, your eyes could really deceive you while you continue to talk yourself into the possibility that what you see is the true reality. Okay. So that's what he means by no eyes, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Because the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind have to really work together. Okay. And so by that, we realize that reality or understanding of the fact that all phenomena are empty is actually a realization of what we call the Buddhist sages, the arhats, the sravakas or the pratyeka buddhas. Right? So ordinary beings rely on their own sensual roots to decide how real what the world is. But as you move on to a sravaka, right, the sage in Buddhism who hears the Dharma thereby attains enlightenment. Okay? I wish I could. I wish I could just listen to the Dharma and become enlightened, but we, I, I'm still not. So a Shravaka man manages to do that by realizing that ultimately even Dukkha itself does not exist. Right? We are the ones who inflict the idea of Dukkha onto ourselves. Right? And then up to the Pratyeka Buddhas who says, okay, I don't just realize that the Four Noble Truths, the, the whole idea of Dukkha and its cause are empty. Even our cycle of birth and death itself is empty. Right? So you will see where he says, there is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, right? and so forth until we come to no decay and death, no extinction of decay and death. So all of these are the 12 items on the 12 links of dependent origination. Right? Due to ignorance, we become conceived. Right? And so in a cycle of 12 links, we begin with ignorance, right? and we, then we allow that ignorant consciousness to take action, to become conceived in the womb. And then within the womb, our consciousness becomes formed again to create the concept of our sensory roots, our perceptions. Right? And once we're born, we discover that we rely heavily on our feelings. Right? Whatever it is that we like, we cling on to it. For example, the chocolate cookie. Um, whatever it is that we don't like, for example, people taking our chocolate cookie, we reject it, we get angry. Right? We become frustrated. And, but the most important thing is we feel that this is exactly the way we exist. And so going from ignorance to mental formation to consciousness to the six sensory roots, then back to name and form, and then finally sensation, perception. Right? We perceive what we want. If we like it, we cling on to it. As we cling on to it, it gets worse. We become attached to it. Right? I'm so attached to my chocolate chip cookies. 
right? But all along, the lady wasn't really attached to her own chocolate chip cookies. What she was attached to was the concept that she owned the cookies, right? And so when that fails to, to really peel off, then dukkha arises. And therefore, this is how we continue to exist. This is how we continue to die and become reborn again. And But Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara says, okay, if you want to understand the emptiness on the second level, realize that none of these are real. You are never born, you will never die. Right? There is no suffering, there is no end of suffering. So in plain words, when we look at level two shunyata, right, we simply need to come to reality to understand that, yes, the world we live in too, just like our understanding of the self, is also constantly changing and will never stay the same. And onto this level, what you see is not what you get. Okay? What you see is never what you get. You experience that every day. You see your beloved ones via FaceTime on your iPhone. Right? You get so happy. Right? But at that moment, you also realize that your loved ones are not right in front of you. Right? This is reality. Make use of your chance to connect, but don't cling on to those moments. Otherwise, you're going to start to feel too calm. And then thirdly, what you, need to, what you see needs to be seen again. Look at it again and again and again. Give yourself a second chance. Give others more chances to show you what reality is. With what? Your bodhisattva eye. So what is that bodhisattva eye? A sense of empathy. empathy right? So now on to the third level. A bodhisattva is compassionate because they are willing to put themselves in our shoes. Right, to feel what we feel for before they arrive at any conclusion. That is a bodhisattva eye. Okay. So a mom once went home and brought two apples to the little girl. Right. So her little girl really loved the two apples, held onto them, looked at them. And then that was the moment when the mom decided to see if the girl would be generous enough to share her apple. So she asked her little girl, hey, you've got two apples, would you like to share? And immediately, immediately upon hearing this, the little girl took a quick bite of each apple on her hand. Right? The mom was so disappointed. Right? She couldn't bring herself to believe that she had raised a greedy, selfish little girl. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if that happened to you, what would your action, next action be? What would you say or do to the girl? Okay, you will ask her, right? Anyone else? Oh, you will ask for a bite of each apple, right? Let me taste what you taste, right? Okay. Anyone else? Oh, you will teach her to share, right? Yeah, don't be greedy, please share. Okay, all right. So we all react very differently to the little girl's action. So if I go back to the story, I would choose your option, right? This mom was so angry, she wanted to teach her little girl to share. But before she said anything, she decided to give her little girl a chance and ask her why, right? Why did you do that, darling? And the little girl then stuck out one of her apples and said, Mom, take this one. This one is sweeter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Therefore, what you, what you have seen, you need to see it again. Don't jump to a conclusion based on your perceptions because others too have their perceptions. Right? Only when the two are harmonized and balanced would you see reality as it is, not reality as it should be. Okay. And so for that reason, when we move on to level three emptiness, right? going from the emptiness of the self, emptiness of the world, emptiness of life and death, right? finally the Bodhisattva says there is no cognition. No attainment and no non-attainment. For there is essentially nothing to be attained. Why? Because by this, anything that you attain or establish becomes a concept or an idea that you will cling tightly onto. But remember, any moment you begin to t cling tightly onto something, that becomes again your chance to what? Suffer. And so on level three shunyata, based on there is no cognition, no attainment, and no non-attainment, in simple words, 
In the Bodhisattva mind, concepts are empty too. The best way to learn is to first unlearn. Right? What you think is, why not begin by thinking, no, it isn't. Think about what else it could be, just in the little girl's case, so to empty ourselves. Well, mind you, that's going to be extremely difficult. Right? Because when you join a meditation retreat, you discover that the venerable spend a lot of time teaching you how to walk and breathe. Why would you spend $100 for a weekend on instructions on how to walk and breathe? Right. Yeah. I've been doing this all my life, right? Why would I ask people to teach me again? Right. See? Then at the end of the day, you discover it was totally worth it. Because what the venerables have shown you is that, yes, I never learned how to walk. I walk with a distracted mind, right? I walk with worries, right? I don't walk with this being mode. By being mode, it means you're in that very moment. And when I'm breathing, when I'm eating, I fail to be in the doing mode. And by doing mode is to focus on nothing but that single action at hand. Right? And so the process of emptying ourselves becomes a chance for us to see through the bodhisattva eyes. And therefore, the only way to keep your hands free is to keep them open. Hold on to no conceptions. Hold on to no principles but believe in the compassion and the empathy and, the empathy and the openness in yourself. Okay. And ultimately, when we talk about looking at the world through a bodhisattva's eye, which is third level shunyata, Avalokiteshvara wants to tell us that there is you in me and there is me in you. Okay. Again, something very difficult to achieve. But we can see this in that famous story in the Vimala Kirti Sutra. Right? When this great, great enlightened Manjusri Bodhisattva and Ahads go and visit a sick man, right? And this lady appears in the room. Okay. What happens was when this lady appears in front of the Ahads and the Bodhisattvas, the man in the middle who was Sariputra, the poor guy, starts to have unpleasant feelings. What he was thinking was, how rude. How dare you, as a woman, appear in front of us great ahads and bodhisattvas when we're talking about the Dharma? Okay. As soon as he thought about that, he caused great trouble because he never realized that this woman was the transformation of a Buddha. So the lady turns around and says, oh, you're such great ahads, right? And then she calls a rain of flowers to shower down onto all of them. But something funny happened. As soon as the flowers landed on the bodhisattva's robes, they just slid off. They didn't even attach. But for the poor Ahad, poor Sariputra, the flowers stuck to his robe like glue. No matter how hard he tried to brush off the flower, it just wouldn't come off. Right. And so the lady turns to the Ahad and says, you're such a great enlight enlightened one then you can't even do so much as letting go of your attachments. Right. So that was a simple, nice lesson. Okay. And then the Arhat still wouldn't let go of the fact that a woman had just taught him a lesson. Right. He turned to her and asked, who are you? Right. She says, I am you. How long have you been in this room? The lady goes, I have been in this room for as long as you have been in the cycle of birth and death. Right. And then he asked her, when will you attain enlightenment? The lady now turns to Sariputra and says, I will attain enlightenment on the day you're willing to turn into a woman. Okay. So this is a very famous story in the Vimalakirti Sutra that teaches us how eventually we go beyond the concept, the, the concepts of reality for to see that the self is you and you are me. So for bodhisattvas, their true liberation is the liberation of living beings. A true compassionate person will never feel at ease until everyone in the same room is also at ease. So that's what she means by I will be attaining enlightenment on the day you as a great man is willing to turn yourself into a woman. Because that moment will be when you're ready to let go of such conceptions. So there's you and me and you and me and uh, you, you and me and me and you teaches the great uh, Dharma gate of non-duality. 
for bodhisattvas who regard all beings as their own. So if you look at it as an equation, you will see that if your enlightenment is only your enlightenment, if you're the, the only one to reach the far shore and leave all the rest of the human beings on this shore, would you feel at peace? Okay. If your answer is no, then you have put yourself in the shoe of a bodhisattva. Right? My enlightenment should equal to your enlightenment. And so this moment, what happens is your true enlightenment becomes the realization that when beings are not well, I will not be well. Right? That's when X doesn't equal to X. Okay. I hope I'm not confusing you. Yeah. So true enlightenment is to realize that your own realization is that of the realization of living beings. Okay. And what we see is then we realize even if we experience dukkha in life, it's okay. It's our chance to experience pain and sentiments and all these emotions. So next time we come across people who have that same experience, we might have a chance to share our experience to help them overcome those easily. Okay. So this is Kevin Hines. He's known as the man who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. He was suffering from severe depression at age 19. So it was the morning when he decided to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. And as he walked from the car park to the Golden Gate Bridge, he made a pact with himself. He said to himself, if between my car and the spot where I jump off, so much as a single person smiles at me, I will give up committing suicide. But unfortunately on that day, nobody managed to smile at him. So he hopped over the railing and jumped. And immediately upon the moment when he let go, he regretted it. Immediately upon the moment he jumped, all he could think about is to try to stay alive. But it was a two degree day. You might imagine the moment you enter that state of free fall, you would travel 800 meters of distance in just two seconds which means your contact with the water surface will be four times as, harder, as hard as your impact with concrete, which means your bone will shatter. So as he realized that, he tried to straighten his entire body to lessen, to minimize the area of contact. So he dropped into the water by straightening his entire spine. As he entered the water, which, which was minus two degrees C, he felt like a thousand needles was piercing through his body. And when the cold water entered his lung and his organs, he felt like it was the needles trying to tear his organs apart. But fortunately, he survived. He broke his spine. It took him two years to recover. He managed to start walking again. But after those few seconds of horrifying experience, he made a vow. He says, I now know how terrible it is to suffer from depression. That will prompt you to committing suicide. So I want to help people release themselves from such anxieties. So after he recovered, he started a foundation. He wrote a book about his encounter. And his foundation has been focusing on helping teenagers who suffer from severe depression. Okay. He says, if only somebody smiled at me on that day, it would have been so different. But then he says, I'm glad I jumped because I now know how to help people. Okay. So if we say, yes, emptiness is form, form is emptiness. Okay. Your suffering is a chance for you to start transforming. The dukkha that you experience will be a chance for you to transform into something wiser. So what we're trying to say here is, as that Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara sits in that beautiful, elegant recline right, and tells you that experience of realizing how we can be empty, how this world can change, and how eventually a Bodhisattva deals with both the existing and empty phenomena of the world. Right? We too can make peace with every single encounter. But there's a catch. You will never be at peace 
if your focus is solely on your individual well-being. Because the Dharma itself has already told us that we are born interconnected and we can never be free from that interconnection. And so as we set out to do more for others, you might discover that you become stronger. Right? As you set out to do more for others, somehow you become much more resourceful. Right? And that's where the self-transformation happens, just like a candle. Right? The more we give, we don't lose, but the more we gain also in retain, return. So I want to close this simple presentation of my understanding of the three types of emptiness set in the Hat Sutra, which you chant almost every week, to think about then how do we remain that wise, compassionate, empty bodhisattvas. Okay. I still see that, which is demonstrated by my teacher. Okay. Venerable Master Xing Yun started to suffer from diabetes at age 90, which meant that he was no longer able to see but he still thought about what he could do to help people. So he came up with a way to write calligraphy without looking. He calls it one-stroke calligraphy. Because to him, he says, if I can't walk, I can't reach out to people, I can't do anything, I'm going to keep writing. So that in this writing, if they embody messages of inspiration, I can still do something for the world. Right? He writes and writes and writes and writes, day and night. And then... Look at his face. Right. The greatest joy comes in the moment when his effort is received by others also in a positive way. Okay. And so for him, there's no longer death or birth. He says, at age 90, I have nothing to lose. I no longer think about death. The only thing I think about is what else can I do? What more can I do with whatever is left of me? Therefore, for a bodhisattva to say that there is no cognition, there is no attainment, there is non, no known attainment, it simply means we let go at the same time, at the right time. So true wisdom seeks no reality. Birth and death no longer matters. But true compassion shall seek nirvana for both the self and others in realizing that the moment I connect with you in life, our life becomes whole. So again, emptiness is form, form is emptiness. What does that mean? Right? There is no others, no self. There is no even state of perfect ease. It doesn't matter. I seek not for my well-being. But at the end, there's no emptiness, no existence, not even a realization of the Buddha himself too. As long as we are helping living beings feel as real and alive as they can be. So Guanin Bodhisattva tells you there's nothing to attain when you realize everything is what you can attain. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you have gained some perspective on the Heart Sutra. Thank you very much.